this week on Core Talk. There was a decision that had to be made of, does this need to be designed for the storm that might happen every 100 years, every 500, because the funding for that can never be unlimited. So it's always an amelioration of risk. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We're a team of professionals, biologists, engineers, real estate and administrative specialists, lawyers, and many other specialties all working together to deliver engineering solutions that are vital to securing our nation, energizing our economy, and reducing disaster risks. Safely, on time, and within budget. This is Core Talk, the USAFE's Norfolk District podcast. From harbor port deepening and coastal storm risk management to environmental restoration and research and development, we exist to serve our community because we are a part of it. Essayons. 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 Let us try. Welcome back to Core Talk. I am James Walker, your host, and I'm here with the Deputy Commander of Norfolk District, Major Tony Funkhauser. Today, we have the Chief of the Operations Branch, along with a very seasoned structural engineer. And they're both going to shed some light about some of the major operations that we have going on at USA's Norfolk District. Let's go ahead and, and start with introductions. Leslie or Chuck, tell us a little bit about yourselves, what you do here, why you do it. Well, I um, actually am a biologist and not an engineer. So um, I got my master's degree from Old Dominion University in um, wetland ecology. So it's sort of a mix of plants, mud, and water, um, I like to say. And during the time I was in school, I had colleagues, you know, classmates that had done internships here at the core for um, credit, and I thought this was a great idea because um, A, it would get me credit and I wouldn't have to sit in a class, and B, um, I, in theory, I would have a foot in the door for maybe a job down the road. So I, I joined in the pack back then and um, ultimately got hired into the regulatory branch and worked almost 10 years here. So um, wow. I did, I left for a while, I did a little federal agency tour with the Navy and the Coast Guard before coming back here to the operations branch in 2021. But um, I think the, you know, while my background is biology, through the course of my career, um, my professional career, I've interacted a lot with the public and I've recognized, um, you know, the things that sort of the public is concerned about, interested in. So in the you know regulatory branch, um, I was issuing permits and, and having to ensure that the things that I permitted were, um, were not going to be impactful, negatively impactful to others. And so that immediately put me into a public position. You know, I spent time doing environmental planning with the Navy and um, Coast Guard and once again was con consistently um, communicating with the public and having to take the public's, you know, um, interest into consideration in the things that were that I did. And um, I was exposed to a number of not only, you know, um, environmental co issues of concern, but also navigational issues and access issues. And so um, that is why I think I enjoy my time in the operations branch now. I get to kind of put all of that back into, um, you know, to place and, and work all of those issues with a really great team. Probably one of the, the most diverse groups in the Corps of Engineers. We have so many different disciplines. So in the operations branch, we have engineers, we have financial managers, we have people who drive boats and survey and you know, just environmental professionals as well. So we have we have it all: um, construction um, control representatives and okay. things like that. So I think it's easy to fit in here. This is an easy place to kind of be the odd man out, if you will, um, because we all have a very different background, but we're working towards common missions. And um, and it it just shows, I think, in the operations branch, it kind of shows that it um, really it takes a village to get some of this stuff done. Chuck Sanders. I'm the structural section design chief here at Norfolk District, and I'm fairly new to that role. I've been in that seat about a year. I was their senior technical lead for about eight years before that, and I've actually been here since I was a student intern back in 2001. There were three of us who were classmates who started here as co-op students, all from the same group. We're all three still here in different parts of the wow. district. And I worked my way up from, from the kids sitting in the corner who couldn't even grow a beard 
doing design calcs and staying out of the way in the meetings to being the senior guy on some of the bigger projects and now as a team lead. It's been fun. I I get to work on a little bit of everything. I joke that I'm a steel and concrete guy, but I mostly end up working on anything that doesn't run away fast enough. I like fixing things. I come from a family of electricians and mechanics. So I see broken stuff and I tend to jump in and try and make it not broken anymore. And by sheer dumb luck, it turns out that seems to be a handy skill around this office. I bet, I imagine. I got into this, t- this kind of work because I had an interest in a teenager and moving bridges. And I lucked into this particular office as a co-op without even realizing that this one district has a third of the moving bridges and the whole Corps of Engineers. And then I ended up in the spot where for quite a while I've been in charge of them, at least in terms of the bridge safety and machinery repair. And I had no idea I was even getting into that. So I've had the great fortune to be the right place in the right time and get to work with an awful lot of great people doing some fun things you don't get to do anywhere else. O&M, Operations and Maintenance. How does this branch facilitate the greater USACE mission? When there's a public need for a particular function or a fix for a problem, so to speak, such as coastal storm risk management, the Corps will get authorization to build a particular um, structure or, or do some type of work to help alleviate that particular problem. So that comes in as new work funding into our projects management division. That once it's actually um, built, constructed and everything, that structure or that function becomes a property of the operations and maintenance. So that's where we come in in the operations branch. We receive funding on the regular to ensure that we keep up these structures and um, navigation channels and things like that. And so it it just kind of shows that that we um, work so collaboratively internally with each other. You know, we pass one project from one group to another. Some of us continue to um, have to work collaboratively with others, such as operations branch with drawbridges and navigation locks. Is we are we're working with Chuck and his folks um, on a very regular basis, and and we continue to um, collaborate. But operations and maintenance is about just that ongoing work to keep these um, these projects that were previously authorized in good working condition. Yeah, so I think the the biggest thing that we've seen is the last couple of podcasts, we've really focused on some of the larger projects. But just like you said, that handover, there's a lot of other things that we're managing with Gathright Dam, Mm -hmm. Cranny Island, the intercoastal waterways. Can you kind of dive into a little bit of that and just kind of explain the day-to-day operations of what we're managing in those areas? So the operations branch primarily has responsibility for navigation, for the Corps' navigation channels, um, which are basically approved at some point to um, ensure commercial um, interests are met. So shipping, commercial fishing, and things like that. So we have navigational channels, and we also have a few flood risk management projects. One of the the major one is Gathright Dam. It's in um, Covington, Virginia, on Mm -hmm. the Jackson River. And the dam was um, built back in the 70s to address what were multiple uh, instances of you know, moderate to severe flooding that, that, you know, people, you know, there was a lot of property loss, um, you know, and damage as a result of that. So um, that is, that's really our bread and butter is navigation and flood risk management. Um, We have on, we have the Craney Island dredge material management area is a 2,500 acre dredge material management site it's it's like no no other the court in the full enterprise doesn't have anything like this um it was authorized um many years back and we're able to use it for not only our own federal dredging projects to dispose of material in the norfolk harbor and adjacent waterways but the public is also able to pay a toll to use it for their work in those same areas if they're doing dredging um and it's a it's a very important resource for us um the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway um, is, we have the Dismal Swamp Canal and the Albemarle and Chesapeake Canal, and that's an inland waterway system that's important for um, ensuring a sheltered um, water, you know, course of water for people to use instead of having to um, go out to sea in the open ocean to travel. So certain certain vessels are not um, 
you know, not well suited for traveling in, in open waters, whether it be barges, um, you know, just because of the way that they're built, they're not, you know, tremendously stable in, in, in rough seas. And um, furthermore, we also, even though the purpose of, you know, the initial purpose for uh, many of our navigational channels is commercial interest, they, they continue to serve for recreational interest as well. And so it's, and in many people's best interest to keep recreational boaters in, in a more sheltered location as well. So those um, facilities in, in those waterways definitely serve that purpose. We have drawbridges and, like I said, navigation locks in multiple places. And, and you know, um, our infrastructure is continuing to age, and so it takes a lot of attention to keep it in good working order. Yeah, I thought it was really cool that Mile Marker Zero starts in Norfolk. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, it's really cool just to see some of the places that, you know, we're helping facilitate a lot of these things. And I, I didn't know that, you know, it goes all the way down to Florida. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's a really cool like capability that we're helping assist in, in, right. and keep that here. So that was cool. There's a national security interest in the intercoastal waterway that most people don't think about as well. Both of our canal sections in this district did predate the Corps taking it over. They were originally created purely for commercial shipping, but my understanding is the impetus of actually creating the intercoastal waterway system as something federally maintained was World War I. Everyone in the U.S. was watching all the massive amount of shipping damage that was being done out in the North Atlantic in that area just, just from early teens era U-boat activity. And they looked at the coast of the U.S. and they saw just how much of our internal shipping traffic was traveling between ports on the edge of the Atlantic out in the open where someone with a periscope and a torpedo could take out years worth of food for a community and said, you know, maybe we should think about doing something about that. You have this long stretch of barrier islands up and down a lot of the coast that give you protection from that. And that's what got, from what I understand, got this program started. Yeah, it's really and cool. It's kind of faded from everybody's mind right now because so much of our shipping vessels have gotten too big to use this type of channel, but it's still got a value. Leslie, there was something you said a little while back when you were talking about problem solving, you used the word alleviate. And I found it very interesting that you chose that word. Could you explain to me, like, because, you know, I, I would imagine a lot of people, when they think of problem solving, they're looking for something definite. I, I think that, um, you know, many of these projects, as I kind of alluded to, are older projects. So a problem statement was made many, many years back. We, we built things or maintain channels to a particular depth many years back to to get to a particular concern now but as we're all aware things continue to change in our world you know so uh, i'm going to use um flooding just for example in in the gathright dam just in particular you know putting in a dam on a river to alleviate you know downstream flooding it doesn't mean that there's never a possibility that that particular area could experience some flooding and they have since the dam's been built but it's it's not been catastrophic at the levels that it was predating the dam so i think that that's important to note we we continue to develop areas and with the development of landscapes and we as a, a society continue to impact the way that, that that landscape can, you know, can attenuate floods and things like that. So I think that's important to note. It's not, it's things are never 100 um, percent. I think that we work for um, reasonable solutions to problems and, you know, and that we if as time moves on, if we recognize that a particular thing that we've done in the past isn't um, is not addressing the issue the way it was originally um, meant to be addressed, then we may get additional congressional authority to to look back into modifying it. Navigation is a good um, example. Right now we're doing the Norfolk Harbor Deepening, which is a new work effort. That's not an operations and maintenance project right now. It will be shortly. <laughs> but um, the reason that we're deepening the Norfolk Harbor is because um, container ships are getting bigger and bigger. We're continuing right. to import much more stuff than we ever have. And the more that we import and, and export, um, the, the more need there are for larger container ships. And the ships are growing 
have um, deeper drafts than they did in the past. And we have to continue to focus on um, addressing that through our deep draft navigation channels. So right now, the Norfolk Harbor deepening is bringing our harbor down to 55 feet. Once that's done, we'll be the deepest, um, the, the Port of Virginia will be the deepest port on the East Coast. Most of the projects we're doing, we're working with and around nature, and there just is no maximum mm -hmm. storm. There is no m number we can say there will never be a storm greater than this. Mm -hmm. So really everything is an alleviation. If you gave me the mission to give you something that was safe and the worst storm that was physically possible, I'd build you a bunker in a mountain because you can't know for sure. What we can know is we've got a couple hundred years of records. We know about how big a storm we can expect maybe every 10 years, maybe every 100 or every 500. So it always comes down to a real mission of looking at the situation and looking at what's out there for environmental issues, the weather, the other problems you have to deal with and saying, okay, here's the need for protection. Here's the resources that we've been given. What's the absolute most we can do to give the most protection for the resources that are available that we can, we can get to do this job? So at the end of the day, even the biggest, tallest wall, you know, we were talking before, before the show about the flood wall in Richmond. When you stand next to that wall, it looks massive. But then you say there was still a design year for that storm. There, there was a decision that had to be made of does this need to be designed for the storm that might happen every 100 years, every 500, because the, right. the funding for that can never be unlimited. So it's really always an amelioration of risk. It's you, Problems like that you can't completely solve. We just make it better for as many people as possible. When I first started working here at Norfolk District, I used to see this uh, acronym, LEDPA. Mm -hmm. um, was at least environmentally... Damaging. damaging. Practicable. 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 That's the, that's the key word. <laughs> that's the one. I like the way doctors put it better. First, to do no harm. Start by not making it worse right. and then figure out what you can do to make it better. Definitely. All right. So let's, let's talk about Craney Island. What's going on there? Well, so um, when you dredge channels, which we do a lot of, um, and, and everybody in an area like this with, you know, waterfront industry and everything, dredging is, is an incessant need. You always have to dredge. Um, you have to get rid of what you dredge up. Um, so your choices really for dredge material disposal are to bring material to um, what they call upland locations, to bring it onto land. And if you think about large metropolitan areas like where we are, um, all of the areas on land are quickly getting gobbled up by development. So, and, and prices for land are, are, are really, ex, you know, expensive. So that's becoming less and less um, practicable. That's to use another use of the term practicable. So the other option that, that um, we have is to bring the material offshore to do ocean disposal. Um, that requires um, transport mm -hmm. further distances so that can be pricey and also um, a lot of testing to ensure that the material is um, you know suitable for placement in water so um, the the craney island dredge material management area has been a huge um, you know savior for us you know in providing a very large um, site where we can get you know, rid of most of what we need in, in this particular um, metropolitan area in the Norfolk Harbor in adjacent waterways. And so we can either pump the material directly in through hydraulic, you know, pumps right into the cells, or there's an area called the rehandling basin where it, a smaller project typically could come in and, and they would put the material in what's called a scow. They can bring the scow into the rehandling basin, open it up and just drop the material in there. And then we, the core, will dredge the rehandling basin and pump it in every you know year to two years or so. Um, so it's a really easy, um, you know, turnkey way to get rid of material. And it's um, just to add to that, the material that we place in Craney, whether it comes from the core dredging projects or from the public, it has to pass certain environmental tests to ensure that it's clean. So, because once it goes into the facility, we dewater it, and it and the effluent water is pumped back into the river. So we don't want to be placing material, you know, water back in the river that it is carrying contaminants or anything like that. So, it's um it's a huge use um you know 
it provides a lot of utility for the maritime industry and for the core itself in this area. I know that's the primary use, but we also have some secondary um, things that we necessarily see. We've got bald eagles that are out there that we're protecting now <laughs> and some other rare bird species that are in the area. So the intent of the island is to get rid of dredge material, but we're constantly bringing you know material in. Um, it's coming from you know, a brackish environment. So it's, there's a good deal of salt in it. It's, um, and so it, it comes in and we get a, an array of salt tolerant plants and, and things that provide some habitat for birds for one thing. And we also have coyotes and foxes and other, uh, other um, critters around there that are living out there and enjoying the solitude of the island. Um, so Every, every spring, we see an influx of our avian friends. They, um, they really like it. It's a great place for them. They build nests every year, and we work around them. Um, they, 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 yeah. they, they tend to nest in the most um, inappropriate places, <laughs> like right in the middle of our roadways of and things. And we cordon those areas off and literally send somebody out every day to map the new locations and in you know exclu areas of exclusion if you will um but we figure it out we we move on we're still able to do business and reduce any potential harm to the resident wildlife while we do so the idea of dredging had never occurred to me before working at u6 and even until this conversation i had no idea that they were taking that sediment out of the water and processing it before putting it out on the island, that's, that's a lot of work. Mm. Yeah, it is. The, the dredges and pump equipment that they use to run this to get the work done, some of it is just impressively massive. Yeah. Just the sheer volume of material you move. Some of the dredges don't actually carry it over by boat. A lot of the bigger dredge projects, we actually have a dredge that's pipelining mm -hmm. over to the site and they can put the pipe right up and over the, the levee and pump directly into the cells when it's clean material. Right. And a lot of these guys are running uh, one foot to one and a half foot diameter pipes using a dredge pump that's run by what's basically a locomotive engine. It takes a lot of power and a, and a lot of oomph to get that work done in a reasonable amount of time with the harbor this large to maintain. On the other side of the Commonwealth, and this question is for you, we have <laughs> Gathright Dam and a lot is going into that as well. Can you explain mm -hmm. some of the interdisciplinary efforts? Gathright is one of the projects we have that requires input from almost everyone in engineering and ops specialties. And it's really a mix. Uh, a lot of the leads on Gathright are really the geotechnical engineering folks, the hydraulics and hydrology folks, mm -hmm. and then my structural team. And then we have a lot of mechanical equipment that's what makes the dam actually work. Gathright's an earth fill dam. So it's got a clay core that's been built up in the river and then protective coatings over that to keep it waterproof. And that's really the stability of the dam itself. Our geotechnical team is the lead on. They do site monitoring, repeated surveys. They have test wells and everything out there because they have to keep track of what the groundwater is doing underneath the dam to keep it stable. And then a lot of the rest of what goes through uh, our intake tower and outflow system really controls how the dam works from day to day. Our chief of hydrology section, Robin Williams, she is the, the genius who keeps it functioning right now as far as daily operations. She has monitoring gauges on the outflow and the inflow of the dam, and she's watching the weather seven days a week, so she knows when to expect exactly how much flow is coming into that lake. She monitors the lake level, and then she is giving direction to the operations personnel who actually operate the dam as to what to set the different gates to so that they're getting the right amount of outflow. And the one people don't actually realize is a big deal, the right temperature of outflow. Really? We have a fairly strict set of temperature regulations for the water coming out of the dam that we have to meet. It's a combination of temperature requirements for the fish that live downstream. Okay. And then a little ways downstream from us, there's also a massive paper mill that's one of the bigger employers in that part of the area that uses that water as process cooling water. So if we let the water get too warm in the middle of summer in that stream, essentially we're both killing the fish and we're breaking a multi-million dollar paper oh. mill. So people think about large amounts of flow coming out of the dam in a storm event, but almost all this dam's life, the system that has actually flowed almost all the water out of it is what's called their water quality system. You have the massive gates everybody thinks of, and then there's this little set of three foot by five foot gates. 
that comes out of a port right in the middle next to the massive gates that really flows all the water because those draw from a different set of ports on the side of the tower that let you pull water from 10 different levels of the lake. So in the summer, when she's got to keep the temperature lowest and has to work the hardest to do it, she's pulling water almost right off the bottom of the lake, very close to it, because that water stays somewhere around 50 degrees year round. But she's got a limited volume of water at that temperature. So as you move into the winter where it's not as hard to keep the water temperature down, she, has, she works with the operations team to change which intake port they're using Right in the middle of winter, they might be pulling right off the top of the lake. Mm. Uh, it might be a mix of two ports to get the temperature right, and it's constantly getting adjusted. So every, everyone always thinks about the big gates, but actually controlling the temperature is probably operationally the most critical thing we're doing. And then all of those ports are hydraulically operated pieces of structural steel. So my team and the mechanical engineers are working constantly with Leslie's team and Robin's folks to make sure that when they need to move a gate, it actually works. And sometimes this is a challenge because the dam is no longer uh, fresh and new. When I started here, we, we could get, a, get away with a lot of things being easy because this was one of the newest dams in the core. And we're now at about 50 years old where a lot of the equipment is hitting its original design life. So we're in the midst of doing lots of our operational inspections and rehab jobs to make sure that we catch things before they break so that we keep it running smoothly. We can't just shut it down and say, well, we're just going to let it not flow for a while while we fix something because then things downstream might die. And this is another one of those examples of what we were talking about in the first episode of this season, unknown unknowns, things that you don't know that you don't know. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that I did not know that temperature was important <laughs> yep. to the dam or to any dam. That's a very, very interesting. I had zero idea when I started getting involved with that project myself about 2009 and found out from Robin pretty quickly just how important that was. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, it just shows that Anthony and the, the rest of the folks out there, it's, it's a nine person team or eight person team that run that facility and mm -hmm. they do an excellent job of maintaining it. Mm -hmm. I got to go down inside, you know, you're like 100, 150 mm -hmm. feet underneath the water, you don't even realize oh, wow. it. Mm -hmm. um, as you're walking down the, or going down the elevator. So really cool and all the work they're doing. Obviously, there's, just like you said, it's, it's going through some wear and tear. Yep. Um, so we're working on improving those things and, and fixing those so we don't have issues in the long term. My fun one a couple of years ago was going down a basket down the wet well. So the lowest port on the south wet well, that's the intake for that water quality system, has a hydraulic leak. And it's not an environmental issue. We're using a biodegradable hydraulic fluid so it doesn't really put anything in danger except their wallets because that biodegradable hydraulic fluid is a lot more expensive than the normal stuff you'd throw out in your Caterpillar dozer where you don't have to worry about it leaking. So the problem is it's the lowest port in the well and that well, that port's about 125 feet down the well and you're underwater for about 80 of those feet at the normal lake level. So the only way to get there is to load two folks in a basket, hang off a crane from the top of the tower, and you just lower all the way down to the bottom and go leak hunting. So that was also a chance to do one of our more regular inspections of the backsides of those intake ports. Some of those hadn't really be, been seen for about 20 years since they were last rehabbed. Usually you do the real inspection on, the, on those at about a 20 to 25 year cycle. And that's turned into a chance to, to kick off another round of maintenance to those because they're getting to the point, too, where they need to be rehabbed right now. Uh, we have a core team up in Marietta, Ohio at a fabrication shop that's in the process of making new hydraulic cylinders for us now so that we can squash the leak issue more effectively and for a whole lot longer than what we could patch up in one day with a crane. A lot of the people that we have here seem to be so, so vital with the information, the knowledge mm -hmm. and know-how that they have, like this uh, Robin Williams that you were just mm -hmm. mentioning, how long does it take somebody to acquire that knowledge? Like if, she, if this person mm -hmm. were to decide to leave the district, yep. how does that person get replaced? Exactly. But not just the body, but everything that that person knows. Yeah. And on top of that, her hydraulics team and my structural team are probably the hardest to hire for because they're much more niche specialties. Hydraulics 
especially, I mean, you get a lot of hydraulics design out in private industry, but it's a different type of work. Rare, they're rarely doing things like designing dam flow systems. That team also does a lot of the analysis for wave action and wave forces for our coastal flood walls. And those are really niche specialty things. So building the team takes a lot of effort on her part just to find good candidates who not only can come in and learn this work, but who want to. Uh, we joke on the structural side, you've almost got to be a little crazy to want to do this anyway, because if I mess something up bad enough, it's not an air conditioning system that breaks and people get uncomfortable. I'm working on a dam with 150 feet of water behind it. I've got to make sure I get it right. And then I've got to make sure a couple of my team cross check everything I did to make sure I got it right, because some of these things, the consequences can be pretty high. So you spend a lot of time trying to focus on getting the right people in who are willing to be diligent and make sure it gets done right the first time so people are safe. So let's talk a little bit about intra intracoastal, not intercoastal, mm -hmm. but intracoastal waterways. Thanks for correcting me earlier. <laughs> Explain for me, what is, what is our area of responsibility and what does it take to maintain it? What type of challenges do we face? Who do we work with to maintain it? It's a tongue twister, so we call it the AIWW, so there you go. we got to make Lucky it short. Things. Yeah, <laughs> we, we um, are responsible for it from, you know, essentially here in, you know, or Norfolk all the way down to about Elizabeth City, North Carolina. And then we, it, it then it continues on all the way down um, through Florida. So Wilmington District picks it up at the, where we leave off. So what do we have to do? Um, we're, we're pretty fortunate that um, it stays pretty naturally deep. We don't have to dredge it very frequently, so that's good. Um, that said, it's um, we have bridges, we have locks, and they're aging, like our other infrastructure. And so um, we we have continual challenges with um, you know with continuing to get keep them in an operational condition. I think the one thing that people lose sight of is these were built so many, many years, decades back, you know, you don't go to like Lowe's and buy replacement parts for your locks, you know, so when things fail, we have to pull them out and rehab them. So it, it, we have multiple pieces for certain components that we keep in spare. So we'll pull them out, put the other one in and then have someone rehab it. Um, Chuck mentioned the Marietta Repair Station, which is a, another core facility that we rely heavily on. They have a lot of metal workers and fabricators, and um, we they will pull parts for us and, and make new ones. Um, so they're critical to, um, to our ability to keep these um, functional. I, we could use private industry to do similar um, fabrication, but it's nice to keep things in-house when we can. Um, Sometimes that's just a schedule challenge. Yeah. Because we do use a lot of local fabricators when we can, but there's a contracting process just to get mm -hmm. there and get to them and get them funded. Right. And if you're standing on a bridge that has a broken piece of machinery on it and that bridge is in the way of a barge sitting there, right. it's very hard, even with some of the emergency contracting powers that are out there, to get a piece in your hands fast enough to fix this piece that's broken right now. Right. Whereas the Marietta team has a machine shop right there in an actual emergency, we can call them, get them a drawing that day of what they need. They'll dig through the material pile and they will make us what we need, throw it in an F-350 with a couple of people and drive it down to us and help put it in. So having that resource available to us has been a lifesaver both on the canals and on Gathra. Yeah. And so um, in addition to that, um, we, we're the Dismal Swamp Canal in particular is heavily wooded on either side. It's a relatively, it's more narrow than even the um, the Albemarle and Chesapeake Canal. And we, we see downed trees regularly. And so our own internal floating plant in the operations branch, which is um, the term we use for those who operate our vessels, um, they will go down there with, um, you know, chainsaws and cranes and things like that and, and get rid of the, the downed trees. As an interesting thing about the Deep Creek Canal in particular, you mentioned that it's maintained shallow. And I, I've seen some people look at it and say, this is so small and it's almost no commercial traffic. Why do we still have it? Mm -hmm. And it is still an important emergency link. Mm -hmm. And the thing that really pointed that out to me as well, right after Hurricane Florence hit Wilmington, what was that, five or six years ago, Wilmington was flooded so badly they were completely cut off from the outside world for a little bit. 
and the main intercoastal waterway channel just south of us, there was bridge damage on the ACC, which is our main commercial channel. So you couldn't really get shipping down that way yet either. The day after the storm cleared Wilmington, Fort Eustis, which has the Army's main East Coast port and shipping set up, loaded three Army landing craft up with emergency supplies for Wilmington. And the day after, at about four in the morning, they came through the Deep Creek Canal because their boats are perfectly shallow enough to go right through there. They were one of the first sets of supplies to make it to Wilmington after the storm, all thanks to where our 130, 140-year-old canal that folks mostly think are too small. So we, it doesn't always serve a vital link every day, but sometimes when you need it, it's the only way to get there. Yeah, definitely having the redundancy of uh, inland water, you know, two different routes, if mm -hmm. you will, um, is, is, is good. And it helps us when we do have a closure on one, um, we, we advise people to utilize the other. And mm -hmm. for the most part, that there, there will be instances where draft limitations on vessels are just too great, um, you know, to utilize one versus the other. And so, you know, but it's nice to have that, you know, mm -hmm. that ability to redirect folks to another waterway. Kind of like maintaining it as a, as a potential, as a plan B to a potential future problem that we mm -hmm. can't yet foresee. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. All right. So how would you qualify your experience as a professional working here at Norfolk District? Your, your, your growth, where you started to where you are now? I think that, you know, whether you're in college or in trade school or just, you know, uh, you know, learn your, your skills on, on your own, much of what you, you know, that we all have developed is like a more, um, you know, academic type strategy for everything. And so, once you enter the workplace, what, whatever that workplace is, you you know um, you you learn quickly that you have to adapt that to the the real world. You got to take your book smarts and make that like bring it to the real world where the rubber meets the road. And that's the thing that I think just comes with time. You know, um, I, you know, I never learned how to deal with problems, and you know, some problems that I get, I. I I'm very fortunate because we all have to have a great network, and we do here, and that's what's great. You know, I can I know that when I hear that so and so has happened, I have to immediately reach out to s these people, these agencies, and do, and and we just have to work together to address that. And I think that's the the thing that you learn over the years of you know kind of being here is just how to um, how to bring all of that to bear. You know, you can't just you know, sit there and think about it for too long. You have to just act. And um, you, you get more confidence at, with experience and, you know, just your ability to take care of those problems yourself and not, you know, certainly there's no value in freaking out. You just have to just get, you know, get the right people going. And I thank my lucky stars every day that I have such a great team, you know, and they're willing to help out and do work um, when they're not scheduled and, you know, um, Chuck will go dangle off a bridge to look <laughs> for a problem and, and my my folks will um, bring out a boat to help him get to where he needs to be. And, you know, it, it's just um, kind of just just adapting to what you need to do to get, you know, get the you know situation back in check, you know. I think that's what's great about it. But nobody's prepared academically for the real world workplace stuff, you know, it's those are the things that you kind of have to just sort of learn as you go. And then once you get that confidence that, you know, that you've got a good team and that you um, you have a, a, a strategy in place for how to deal with it, then, you know, it's a lot easier, I think. Sounds like the learning never stops. No, it never stops. I think the other biggest thing that I've learned in my time doing this that I now tell almost every new engineer also is you... Universities tell you they're minting a new engineer and they're going to send you out as an engineer ready to go. Mm -hmm. And that really makes things look good on their side. I can appreciate why they're doing that. But at the same time, when you come out into the workforce as a new engineer, they don't warn you that they've only taught you maybe 4% of what you need to know. Oh, wow. There is not enough time to actually get someone the skill set they need to be an engineer in a four-year university program. And the biggest drawback to that is every new engineer gets out here, they get to doing stuff for about a year, and they get the worst case of imposter syndrome that you've ever seen 
because you're you're diving into these projects where suddenly you've got to figure out how to fix some 90-year-old broken piece of equipment and going, I'm not the guy who knows how to do this. Yeah, I, I'm just sitting here taking up a paycheck and I feel like a fake. And you know, everybody in engineering really goes through that. I started that way. I sure didn't know how to do any of this stuff either. And I just have to tell them, you know, you're, you're picking up 4% with a bachelor's, maybe 5% if you get a master's of what you need oh, wow. to do to do this. And all of it is learned on the job. I had two senior structural engineers that taught me when I first started, Pat Jones and Brad Atkins. Brad is still up at one of our field offices at Fort Eustace. And I learned 80% of what I know about how to do this from those two guys. They took in the young kid who couldn't even grow a beard yet and taught me how to do stuff and actually be an engineer and be useful. And half my job now as a section chief is just taking the new grads and doing the same thing. School can't prepare them for doing the actual work. I've got to teach them how to do the job. No one else can do that. You can't learn it anywhere else. But when you hit that imposter syndrome roadblock and you feel like it's really getting you, just know everybody else has been there because that's how it is for all of us starting out. I. I'll go even beyond the engineers because, like I said, we've got so many different folks in ops. And I, mm -hmm. I speak of, you know, one of our most dramatic things that we deal with is sunken vessels. But um, the the boat that sank in the James last year, we our options are are limited to getting a boat out of a channel, especially a deeper channel. But um, my my team of boat operators got on our derrick boat and went out and picked it up with the big crane and it came up in pieces. And we, other than that, we literally would have to s typically send a salvage, you know, a contract for a salvage crew or work with the Navy to, um, you know, to, to help with salvage, you know, to float a vessel. But these guys um, just used their um, noggins and got creative and pulled it up and Honestly, we thought it would come up like toothpicks, but it came up almost in one piece. And, and, <laughs> and um, I think that it's good. You know, it gives people the ability to be creative, to solve problems, and at least give it a try. And, um, and once they get that experience base and they've had some successes, I think they're more willing to, you know, to, to repeat and do it again. You know, um, you know it's just it, you get confidence with, um, with time and, and doing things repeatedly. Yeah, and I, I think it goes back, you know, like you said, the education is the baseline, right? Mm -hmm. And then once you get into the organization, it's the people that are helping you mentor, you know, mm -hmm. each other, mentor your 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 folks that are incoming, so you can, you grow and you build that twenty year career. Um, but it's also those experiences and those mm -hmm. challenges that you're mm -hmm. never going to see until you come to the district that you got to mm -hmm. figure out how to how to solve a problem, solve and work together as a team. Because mm -hmm. uh, if we're not working as a team and using all those dis uh, interdisciplinary. Um, aspects of what we have across the organization like we're never going to solve problems and I think that's what's so great about being here is that everyone works together as a team to solve whatever problem comes at hand especially like you go for routine maintenance mm -hmm. and operations and then that thing picks up all right something happens at you know great bridge locks or something like that and then we all got to react to the problem set just like we would do in the army as a battle drill right mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's just figuring out who the right people are to contact and then we go from there to figure out how to solve the problem. And that training and mentoring we do is probably the most important single thing we do every day. Right. I've seen more than a few outside engineering firms who don't want to train anymore. They want to hire you when you've got about two or three, eight years of experience, work you like a rented mule for about three years till you burn out, and then you finally give up and leave in disgust, and they don't want to give you any support. It's not every firm that does that, but there have been more than a few I've seen friends working with. And my biggest goal when I come in here every day is to make sure we don't do that here. I don't want to see that environment for the other people I have to work with. And when you do that, you don't build that team of people who 10 years later know, well, this is how we put this one broken thing back together 10 years ago and know how to fix it. You burn everyone out and you lose all your resource of people with knowledge. Yeah. I think um, an important thing for me, uh, you know, it, from a supervisory and management perspective is giving people the latitude to do the things are they legal ethical and mm -hmm. safe and if so let them use their own judgment to to uh, tackle these problems because it you know it that like i said builds the confidence and um and it gives them pride in what they do and mm -hmm. so that's um, an important thing for me just uh, ensuring that i'm giving them that you know ability to 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 solve problems themselves 
I agree with that really strongly. I think the biggest part of my job is to, to get my guys the tools, room, and resources and help they need to get the job done and then try and get out of their way till they need me. I think one of the most tangible things that we can probably all relate to is um, especially related to the navigation mission. And without providing the navigation channels for we would not be getting our I joke about we're, we're helping all of our Amazon habits continue, you know, but all of much of what we use every day to live our lives comes in through, um, you know, from other countries on ships. And if we weren't doing our jobs right, we wouldn't be getting that stuff here. Um, and, and the other thing that we're doing is making sure that the waterways that others use, even for recreational purposes, are safe. You know, so um, if we have hazards out there, we're, you know, we're, you know, removing the hazards to navigation within our areas of responsibility. So we're ensuring that people are able to go and use these waterways safely as well. For my end, and I'm in design branch, so we have Leslie's group really is only one of our project partners. We work with a little bit of everybody. We work with, with her team on the projects we've talked about this morning, but in design branch, we're also doing military construction. So we've done in the last 10 years, uh, a lot of troop barracks. We've done aircraft hangars that are protecting aircraft that are each worth 30 times what the building it's in is worth. We've done a lot of dining halls. We've done a lot of building rehab work, just trying to make sure that the buildings that the troops on the military construction side are working on are safe for them to use and actually effective. We do a lot of other civil works construction that doesn't necessarily tie in with uh, O&M, with operations section as well. Right now, my team's deeply involved in design of the first phase for the Norfolk flood wall that's going up. Uh, for folks wanting to look it up, it's the Norfolk Coastal Storm Risk Management Project because we can't use simple words for the government. But that's one of our major projects right now, and we're involved in the early study phases for a similar Coastal Storm Risk Management Project studies for Virginia Beach. We're working multiple projects in Florida right now uh, for Miami, Collier County. So my team touches a little bit of everything all around. Uh, historically, we've done some dam removals of dangerous dams. Uh, Amory Dam in Fredericksburg was uh, heavily silted up and on verge of failure, and I was involved in that removal as a, as a junior engineer. So we do a little bit of everything, and it touches a little bit of everything in ways a lot of people don't realize. Because hopefully, if we do it right, they don't notice what we did. I think sometimes you only really notice it if we don't do something right, you get a squeaky wheel where it starts to irritate people. So we're hoping to fix things and be as invisible as possible so everyone's day goes a little bit smoother. They don't see a pothole on the bridge deck. They're not worrying about flooding from some ancient creaky dam upstream. You know, everything just maybe works and they can go about doing what they're trying to do. One, thank you, Leslie and Chuck, for coming on. Um, I know there's... You know, over 400 employees in the organization. I've been here for like four months. Haven't met you yet, but this is like an awesome first introduction, <laughs> right? So I, I want to go pick your brain more because I know you have a lot of history of this organization, Absolutely. right? So uh, one, thank you for uh, coming out here for this podcast, and uh, I really appreciate you guys being on the team. Yeah, thank you for giving us uh, giving us a sneak peek into into your world and getting, giving us a glimpse of the diverse and critical um, projects that you guys are working on. To the listeners, thank you for tuning in. And as always, if you have any recommendations or any concerns or any questions about our podcast, or if you have any particular topics that you would like to hear us discuss, please reach out, comment, like, share, subscribe. Again, thank you for being with us on Core Talk. Thank you, guys. Thanks, James. That's it. Thank you.